I would like to call this Rockingham County School Board meeting for October 26th of 2020 to order. First item of business is to approve tonight's operating agenda. May I have a motion? I move, I move that we approve the operating uh, agenda. Thank you, Dr. McWilkin. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Any discussion on the agenda? Hearing none, please cast your vote. It passes unanimously, 4-0. And I would just like to mention that uh, Ms. Lohr is unable to join us this evening because I think the word is that she snowed in in Wyoming. Next up, would you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? If we could join together for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Now on the agenda are comments from the public. We have a sign up sheet that people have, that three individuals have signed to speak. I'd like to first call on Amber Ham, please. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns this evening. As we all know, the COVID pandemic has transformed into a world of unknowns. Students, parents, schools, and the community have had to make drastic changes and be innovative because this has not been a typical year. In order to adjust, we needed to look at outside the box of what typically has been done, especially to those who are the most vulnerable and have disabilities. I have two children with IEPs, which gives them the support and services needed to, due to their struggles with their disabilities. One is in middle school and one is in high school. For some students, kids may be striving based on the services and supports they are receiving. However, I know this is not the case for all students. As I continue to work with families that reach out to me and advocating for services with my own children. With my children in middle school, with my child in middle school, the school ha was, has willingly offered some services to my children that have made a huge impact to his success. However, my high school child has struggled this year. As she tra transitioned to high school, she lost naturalistic supports and services. And then due to COVID, the school has chosen not to give her the services and supports that she received last year. My child's disability creates her to be impulsive, trouble processing directions and understanding them, and difficulty with transitions, to name a few. We continuously hear from the school that grace should be applied to all students, not just students, not just children with disabilities. My, children has, my child has the drive to do her best and wants to succeed. However, in some assignments, her disability has caused her abilities and grades to be compromised. 
because she needs to be reminded to slow down or needs help to understand directions. We have noticed when this has occurred and have tried to work with our daughter to overcome her disabilities by giving her the support at home. I have asked her to redo the assignments and resubmit them. In one assignment, she received a 50% because she did not complete it. It took her 10 seconds to draw four lines to fix it before she resubmitted it. However, the teacher in the school will not accept these resubmitted assignments, even though it reflects her disability and the lack of supports and services she has been given. After receiving the school's response, I sent a concern to the district level administration. They referred me back to the school. So I have sent my concerns to, to higher district administration and I'm waiting a response. I have heard from the school board members that the schools will, will be giving students and families grace during the difficult times and I believe the school board members are giving the schools the fle flexibility to do, do so. I have heard in public meetings and through emails that the schools are giving grace to their students. I agree that certain teachers, administration, and schools are giving some students grace. However, this has not been a district response to all students. Some teachers, administrators, and schools have chosen to not give grace to their vulnerable students with disabilities. They have chosen not to look through the lenses of the students with disabilities to give them grace in the needed supports, services, and accommodations. The students are expected to overcome their disabilities with less supports from the school. A disability is not something a student can just overcome because the school is choosing to give them less services, supports, and accommodations. A student with a disability cannot just overcome their disability because they are now expected to perform at a faster pace because they are now in, ho in high school or now in the seventh grade. A student with disabilities cannot just overcome their disability because it's harder for the school to provide the support, services, and accommodations due to COVID. In many cases, it is a violation of clearly established laws according to FAPE and IDEA to not provide these needed supports due to the lack of staffing, funding, or COVID. I am asking that Rockingham County Schools provide the supports, services, accommodations, and grace needed for all students with disabilities during this difficult time and in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your email today. Next up is Elizabeth Myers. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I recently entered into a discussion with my school board member on Facebook. Now, I fully admit that Facebook is not a place to have discussions. It should be a place to share photos of kids and pets and all things nice, but unfortunately, the platform has become much different. I was responding to a post that the member made about the reopening of schools with a political tone. I realized that I should not have entered that discussion on Facebook, and for that, I am sorry. However, I'm not sorry for the content of that discussion, and I feel it needs to be brought into the public arena. The citizens of Rockingham County elect you, the school board members. The citizens vote for you based on past records and promises made during campaigning. The members of this board made a conscious choice to run, feeling they can improve our schools and community. All, poli excuse me, all public officials must understand that people will have different opinions, and those are not personal attacks. As a parent with students in the school system, I understand that you have an impossible job. No matter the decision you make, someone will be unhappy. Your job is tougher because you're dealing with the children of Rockingham County, and everyone feels as though they have their best interest at heart. Parents who speak out are not being mean or personally attacking you. They are just speaking up for their children. It is our civic right and duty to question our elected officials, and that's what makes America a great country to live in. I'm sure at one time or another, each of you have questioned your own elected officials. As an elected official, it is your duty and responsibility to listen and respond to the voters of Rockingham County. This is where sometimes I feel the school board comes up short. The school board has obtained a reputation of being unapproachable. I've spoken with several parents who have said they are afraid to speak up as it is interpreted as a personal attack and they feel retaliation. I've heard the same from people who work in the school system. 
I know you care for our students and truly believe you're doing what is best for them. We want open discussion without political overtones. I personally do not care which side of the aisle you sit on and politics has no place in our schools. We want to feel as though we can approach you with our questions and concerns and not be worried that it is interpreted as a personal attack. We all want what is best for the students and we need to find common ground to make that happen. A friend recently shared a quote that I thought is a good reminder to all public officials. Being a leader means you listen to everyone. So tonight, I ask the school board to remember your responsibility to listen and be open-minded with your constituents, and we will try to do the same. We, the people of Rockingham County, hired you. We, the people, hired you, and we want to have a voice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha, Keisha Tut? If I'm not saying that right, let me know, please. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Scheichel. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. My name is Keisha Tutt. I'm vice president of the Rockingham County Education Association. And I came tonight to say, please give teachers and instructional staff the option to work from home on Wednesday. Thank you. Do we have some online comments? Yes, we do. Um, as has been customary over the last few months, uh, we had a Google form again where um, people could submit their comments, and we have six uh, comments for tonight's board meeting. The first one is from Anna Williams. I have been keeping my nieces during the day while they do their online schooling and they were very excited to return to school in November. However, after seeing the way safety protocols are not being followed in the RCPS elementary schools, they've sadly had to transfer to the HLA option. We live with a family member who has a weakened immune system and are taking health precautions very seriously but felt confident with the school's plan of students staying six feet apart and wearing masks at school so they were signed up with the hybrid option. The pictures and videos that are being posted on Facebook and Seesaw of elementary schools in the county showed this is not the case. Not only are students not staying six feet apart, but the schools are flaunting that disregard for student and staff safety and posting it online proudly. I'm not talking about pictures where students are together for a moment to take a group picture on Unity Day or when they are together for a moment when they arrive to school, but pictures showing students sitting at their desks or in neighborhoods on, uh, or on mats within one foot of each other where they clearly would be staying for more than 15 minutes. There are pictures of students sitting elbow to elbow at tables and on rugs with teachers in front of them teaching, sometimes without wearing masks. I don't understand how this is acceptable to the school board and superintendent, most of whom are active on social media and would have definitely seen these pictures over the past two months. Who is responsible for making sure that safety protocols are followed? If the principals are not making sure the schools are safe, why isn't the school board stepping in? My family knows how important an in-school education is and hate that our girls are missing out on it because of the district not holding itself accountable for its own plan. The next comment is from Christy German. I'm struggling to determine who this new hybrid plan is actually going to benefit. Not the guardians who still need to find childcare for their students three days a week. Not the guardians who knew the child would be busy four days a week and now only have a strict schedule to follow for two days a week. Not the students who will be asked to complete three days of asynchronous assignments when they were not even completing the one. Recent trends have shown students just don't do homework, which is why many teachers don't assign it. Not the students who are going to get new teachers in the middle of the semester. Not the students who have D's and F's because they don't do work when they're not with a teacher. Now they will only be interacting with a teacher twice a week. 
not the students who need, needed to work from their school because they had no internet connection at home. Now they will have three days of asynchronous work and no place to complete it. Not the special education students who were seemingly not considered during the hybrid model planning. Not the special education students who may only have their special education teacher give them consultant services. Uh, this only involves meeting with the student and the teachers. The special ed education teacher cannot be in classes to help supply accommodations. Not the special education teachers who are now being asked to be at least in five different classes at once to make sure they are meeting legal requirements. Not the teachers who just felt they were figuring out how to teach virtually. They've worked tirelessly to figure out virtual best practices and now are being asked to start over and figure out hybrid best practices. Not the teachers who are being asked to eat their lunch in a small classroom where students will be eating with their masks off, leading some teachers to decide they just won't eat, not to mention they're not being compensated for having an unencumbered lunch. Not the teachers who are being asked to teach virtual classes during their planning as well. Not the teachers who are now tasked with maintaining public health when we all know it's nearly impossible to keep things clean <coughs> and organized when children are involved. Not the teachers who now feel as if they may be irresponsible to spend the holidays with their own families. Not the teachers whose administrators told them that the only time they can take bathroom breaks is during their planning period because they need to be monitoring students at all times. Not the teachers who would be willing to resign if their families could go without their paycheck. Not the school system which couldn't supply raises. It now will need to spend more money on plexiglass, face shields, microfiber rags, and sanitizer to keep us safe. Not the school system whose budget will also take a hit because teachers will keep their windows open in the winter to ensure proper ventilation. Heating the buildings will be difficult. Not the administrators and guidance counselors who are now tasked with making this impossible schedule work. Not the custodians who have worked endlessly to keep the building clean for teachers and staff and now we'll see their workload increase. So after seeing all this, I truly would like to know just who does this plan really benefit. Um, the next comment is from Olivia Haimani. I'm very concerned about the November 16 in-person return to school, especially with the uh, continued high rate of COVID-19 in our community and the potential spreading events being held in our communities. Please put the health and safety of our school communities, our families, and our neighbors first, and move up the proposed start date to the beginning of the next semester. First, I'm appalled every time I hear anyone attempt to describe JMU as separate from our community. JMU students, faculty, and staff are our neighbors, our friends, our babysitters, our fellow diners, our fellow shoppers, interns at our places of businesses, of business to include the hospital, members of our congregations, etc as are their household members. To imply that COVID-19 on campus does not substantially impact Rockingham County is irrational. Two heavily attended events of the past week that I'm sure you are well aware of explain why the numbers in our area remain high, including the Rockingham County Parks and Recreation Halloween event at the Crossroads Park and the multiple family hosted ERHS homecoming party. Neither event enforced nor even required masking or physical distancing, yet both drew hundreds. These events are examples of potential super spreader events that show a lack of regard for the greater community. Sadly, our community continues to face many barriers to physical distancing and mask wearing. I've been so concerned with why anyone thinks it is a good idea to send the kids back to in-person school right before the holidays, cold and flu season, that I forgot about the foolish risks many of our community members have taken or are planning to take for Halloween. Please consider moving up the in-person return date to the next semester after we see the impact from the winter. Health experts have warned we are likely to see a surge in coronavirus cases. As the seasons change, people spend more time indoors with less ventilation and personal space and the typical increase in respiratory illness that occur in the winter. Please put the health and safety of our school communities, our families, and our neighbors first and move up the proposed start date to the beginning of the next semester. The next comment is from Megan Schaefer. While I agree that there's a need for kids to be back in school, I'm not sure if implementing this new hybrid schedule is smart prior to the holiday season. And finally, Jenny Weitzecker. I can understand why many parents have pressed to get schools to open more fully. However, to wait until November 16 at this point seems like too little too late. That is right before the holidays, which, is then, uh, which will then be followed by a couple of weeks of no school. Our children have been through so many things, uh, changes over the past eight months. To make this change right before Thanksgiving, only for there to be possibly even more changes in their lives during the holidays, seems counterproductive. Some children handle change better than others, but I know several for whom this will have a negative impact. In addition, 
Experts have predicted a significant increase in coronavirus cases to be imminent. It is my opinion that waiting to make changes at the start of a new semester would be the best. Thank you. And that was the last comment submitted. <coughs> is there anyone else who would like to address the board this evening? All right, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is highlight by board members. Dr. McQuicken. Thank you, Mr. Falk. I would like to say that on Saturday afternoon at Spotswood High School, the bands performed for their parents. Uh, and I understand it was a, a wonderful event. The, the article in the DNR today uh, quoted some of the students and they really felt good about the opportunity to do this. No competition, just presenting. And secondly, uh, we're looking forward to hearing and seeing uh, Dale McAllister and all the other speakers with the biography of Lucy Francis Sims, which he wrote, and the unveiling will be tomorrow evening. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Breeden. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Uh, I'd just like to continue to thank everyone who's working through this as, as best we can in, in, all, um, in all directions. Uh, I do have a question, Dr. Scheichel, that I will save to uh, uh, item number six on our agenda for school board answers uh, concerning a meeting I had with a parent in my office uh, to deal with some of the issues that Ms. Ham spoke about. So I'll save that till the question and answer period. Ms. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Um, the only thing I want to bring up is last week, I think on Wednesday, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald and I met with the East Rockingham um, Agricultural Advisory Council. I think I got that right, right? Um, and so um, it was a great conversation, um, a lot of candid feedback as part of that conversation. Um, there were teachers, CTE teachers there, parents, community members. <laughs> Um, and I appreciated how forthright they were um, in the information that they shared with me, and I got a lot of good information. I am, as people know, I didn't grow up in an agricultural family or community, and so um, I always welcome the opportunities to meet with um, the people that are very active in that community, um, and our teachers out there, particularly in CTE, are really doing a yeoman's job with not having the capability to do a lot of hands-on work. So. Um, if you, Mr. Fitzgerald, would extend my thanks to them too, but um, I really appreciated the opportunity to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Dr. Scheichel. Yeah, I will echo what um, Dr. McQuilkin had said. Um, I had a chance last week to watch the Broadway band rehearse at the Broadway uh, High School Stadium, and it was such a neat interaction, you know, with talking uh, to some of the students and to the band director just to see you know, what, um, what the school has done to make it possible for kids to still you know, participate in activities like that. Uh, you know, we see it in athletics to some extent. We see it in, again, some of the hands-on uh, learning activities that small groups are coming to the schools for. And um, yeah, they were all looking forward to Saturday. And then I know on Saturday they performed for each other, basically the bands, uh, as they usually do in the showcase. And so this time, it was a little bit of a different uh, environment, of course, but uh, it was really neat to observe how the students, you know, use their own creativity and and the the band directors, you know, creating a choreography that would allow for the appropriate distancing while still, you know, pr uh, producing high quality um, showcase events. Thank you, sir. Moving now into the action part of our agenda. First item is approval of minutes from our last meeting on October 12th. May I have a motion to that? I move that we approve the minutes of the October 12th meeting. Thank you, Mr. Breeden. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Reed. It's been moved and properly seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, please cast your vote. The minutes pass for zero. 
policy revisions. Hello, Dr. Aldifer. Good evening. Chairman Falk, members of the board, Dr. Scheichel, uh, we have for you this evening six policies uh, that were provided last uh, meeting for information, and we are bringing those forth for action this evening. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about those policies. Board members, do you have any questions for Dr. Aldifer about these policies? Um, I have one question. Sure. And perhaps it may be that we need to make a motion and then um, modify it, but the possibility for GCBD8, which is the holidays, if we can remove the terminology that says two days during the spring to be designated and just leave it to be two days to be designated by the superintendent. I hate us to eliminate our, set, our kind of limit ourselves by saying that they need to be in the spring, and mm -hmm. that I think that will help the longevity of this policy. Okay. Okay. Is that something that you all want to make an amendment to that, or how, how would you like to handle? Should I bring I it back later? What's the best way? I think we can make a motion for the approval of the policies and then amend it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what did you say? <laughs> Um, for which part, Mr. Falk? Well, just um, uh, typically, right, yeah. but we make the motion to approve the policy and then uh, uh, someone makes a motion to amend it to that yeah. effect? Yes, okay. If, so if you would want to, Ms. Reed, make that motion and just in your motion okay. move for approval, including the amendment to that particular policy. Okay. That okay. would be the best way to do it. Okay. So um, I move that we approve the policies as recommend well as recommended by the superintendent, uh, with the exception of making a change to policy GCB dash eight, I guess it is uh, dash eight to change the words from two days during the spring to be designated by the superintendent to two days to be designated by the superintendent. May I have a second to that motion? Second. It's been moved and seconded with an amendment. Is there any discussion? Any further questions? Hearing none, please cast your vote. Thanks, Ms. Bocas. The motion passes. Four zero. Thank you, Dr. Aldifer. Budget calendar for yep. 2021. I'll present that um, to you in public content, so it's also available um, to the public. You can see the budget calendar. Um, pretty difficult to believe that we're already talking about budget for the 21-22 uh, fiscal year. But uh, the calendar mirrors closely what we have done in the past. So um, in the next few days, budget information will be distributed to principals, and then um, schools have until December 
uh, to bring their requests to us. Uh, they are due um, by January 8th then to Ms. Mast and uh, the first public hearing on the budget will take place January 11th. Uh, we'll look as, as always at all the budget requests first as you remember um, a lot of times that can um, add up to you know more than 10, 10 million dollars uh, just to look at what we really could use and then uh, as the general assembly meets you know we'll look at the governor's budget uh, we'll discuss expenditure um, forecasts and the general assembly revenue and then in March, again, we'll discuss our revenue and expenditures. And on March 22nd, um, I will present the uh, recommended budget. And then uh, we'll have another public hearing following that. And at some point in March, uh, usually, um, again, at the very end of March, uh, there'll be a vote on the 21-22 budget. And I recommend approval of this budget calendar. Thank you, Dr. Scheichel. Board members, we have a recommendation from the superintendent. May I have a motion to that effect? I move that we accept the uh, budget calendar recommended by the superintendent. Thank you, Dr. McQuilkin. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Reed. It's been moved and properly seconded. Are there any questions or discussion concerning the budget calendar for next fiscal year? Hearing none, please cast your vote. The motion passes 4-0. Challenge parent advisory board for the next year. Chairman Falk, school board members, and Dr. Scheichel, before I present the action item on your agenda, I wanted to give you a quick update on the currently uh, identified gifted challenge students and how they are being serviced in our division since this will be shared and already has been through letters to parents and at our first advisory meeting virtually in November. There's three meetings a year with the uh, identified gifted uh, parent advisory board. So I thought you might be interested in currently how our gifted students are being serviced and how we plan to expand that uh, as students return or stay virtual. And as I said, parents have received this uh, information uh, and will be updated in November. Uh, currently, there are four secondary, that's high school and middle challenge teachers and five elementary challenge teachers who have worked really hard to provide meaningful instruction and enrichment for all gifted students in the division. Mornings have been dedicated to synchronous learning and afternoons for four days provide additional optional enrichment opportunities on a voluntary sign up. All of these occur by Zoom or Seesaw and they offer inquiry based higher order thinking skill activities led by the teacher and it includes so many challenges, construction and elective classes. When students enter uh, in November in an AB schedule, every student will still be able to sign up for either one and in some cases uh, all the elementary will have the option to sign up for two um, of these courses. So I just thought you might be interested uh, about the popularity of these sessions. We have 336 identified elementary challenge students and 497 middle school students. The high school students um, currently do a lot of other different activities with secondary gifted teachers. So I'll concentrate on this. In third grade, 93 students have signed up and are participating in these sessions. S Secret Agent Spies, Tall Tales, Wild Stories, and a STEM project tool into the deep, deep oceans and our Martians real. 83 fourth graders across the division signed up for Yuck, Growth Science, Strange and Wonderful Structures, Build It, It's a Mystery, Forensic Science, Machines and Contraptions. 139 fifth graders have signed up and participate in Could It Happen, 
weird plants and animals, crazy numbers, ancient number systems, can you survive, and product designer, can you create it? In the middle school, 50 signed up and participate in geography and anthropology of Kenya, 39 for the uncontracted tribes of New Guinea, and 39 signed up for the sea nomads in Southeast Asia. At the same time, 100 secondary students take part in Mindful Mondays, and they are working during those sessions about what it is to be gifted, what, uh, how to do self-advocacy, and, and it's just pretty fascinating to watch that. Uh, and of those 100 students, 30 to 50 attend the Zoom sessions every week. In the uh, Tuesday sessions, 50 are currently in the stock market game. And on Friday, which is called Freestyle Friday with guest speakers, mathematical darts, optional illusions, there's 110 students. So as we explore ways to provide instruction, creativity, and hands-on learning while giving students choices, I'm happy to report that the gifted service model that's happening allows every student, regardless of zip code, to have equitable gifted service. At this time, I present for your approval the action item naming the parent representative for each school for the gifted parent advisory. Thank you, Dr. Pence. You have the uh, proposed challenge parent advisory board members in your materials. I know there are some that still are to be determined um, at a few of the elementary schools, but I do recommend approval of this list um, as presented. Board members, we have a recommendation to approve from the superintendent. May I have a motion in support, please? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation with regards to the cha uh, challenge parent advisory board members. Thank you, Mr. Breeden. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. McWilkin. It's been moved and properly seconded. Is there any discussion? Do you have any questions for Dr. Pence? Dr. Pence, um, how many of these advisory board members are teachers within the school system? Do you know? I didn't hear. Pence. How many of the um, of these advisory board members are actually teachers within our school system? Do you know? I, I, um, I'm not aware that there are. They really, uh, if there are, it would be very, uh, very few. Okay. Uh, and usually they are like, I don't mean to laugh, Foxies, but they really do try to reach out. Okay, great. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you for your work on this. Mm -hmm. Hearing no further questions, please cast your vote. motion passes 4-0. Moving into information items part of the agenda, superintendent COVID update. <clears throat> Chair Falk, members of the board, um, tonight I'll just present a quick update regarding the health data. At the last board meeting we talked about uh, the foundation of safely opening our schools being um, the you know, community health data and also the mitigation strategies that we're able to put in place for um, obviously the fact that uh, there are uh, a number of residents in Rockingham County who do have COVID-19 just as they are across the state, across the country and across the globe. Uh, but it's important uh, that we take a look at uh, you know, the trends and uh, we've said from the very beginning you know, we will uh, take a careful look at this, and what we do need is the help of the community, again, to get those numbers down. There were comments earlier about events, you know, where uh, masks are not worn, where uh, people do not maintain any distancing, and of course, if we see, again, this kind of increase in cases, uh, then that will certainly, you know, uh, lead to additional conversations about 
um, how we can safely bring uh, staff and students back. So if you look, uh, there's sometimes this image that somehow we're sticking out and we're doing things, you know, we're not bringing the kids back and we're kind of an outlier there. And it's not really true. Um, when you look at the school reopening plans in Virginia, um, there are a lot of, of uh, school districts, a lot of counties and, and cities that are in, in that uh, green color that's basically fully remote. So 68 of 132 school divisions are fully remote. Uh, they teach completely um, online, right? And uh, then there are some uh, that are in person, 10 school divisions. Now, early on, those were mostly school divisions that had almost no community spread or have um, the ability to bring more students back in person based on the number of students they have in the schools. But, and again, the, the community spread was, in some of these, it was zero. There's not a single person in the community known to have COVID-19. Now, that's not everyone, but um, again, 10 out of 132. But then you see um, the yellow, and I'm highlighting Rockingham County. I know that shouldn't be necessary, but I promise you, I've sent this map to people, and then I got a text back and says, um, just asking which one are we? And so I just want to make sure that I make it clear here, this is Rockingham County there in, in the circle. And um, we are one of 25 school divisions that is partial in person, so where we're basically bringing some students back in person, uh, pre-K through first, and then others are in, in hybrid. And, and again, we're changing that to um, you know, on November 16th to bring more students back uh, in person. Um, and so again, there's a, a wide variety, but uh, certainly you know, the majority of school divisions are actually fully remote. But again, some of those are changing now as well. Um, when we look at the health data, we said last time, you know, we don't want Rockingham County sticking out in red. And if you look at the data as of, this is the map as of today, and for those who want to um, look at that pandemic metrics uh, dashboard uh, that VDH puts up every day, uh, the link is on that slide as well. And so when, once we post this, you know, it's a live link, uh, you can click on it and every day you can look at a number of different uh, metrics, but no longer in red, and that's a good sign, right? That's what we said last time, we don't want to see red. And comparing that to other school divisions, uh, these are all the school divisions that uh, Rockingham County has um, a border with, but including then Virginia Beach. And Virginia Beach, specifically because uh, there's still this kind of idea that Virginia Beach is a hotspot, they're not, but Virginia Beach is also at the lower grade levels uh, doing something that um, I thought they were the only division that's doing this, but there are a couple others. And so they had a conversation with uh, someone from DOE with an assistant superintendent to get information of some of the other school districts. Virginia Beach is operating at the distance that's permitted uh, by the Virginia reopening plan, is also based on the recommendation of the World Health Organization, but is not currently endorsed by either the CDC or Virginia Department of Health, and that's at a three-foot distance. And there were a number of comments that I've received. Um, why, the, why is Rockham County going back to school at three foot distancing? Uh, we're not, we're going back at six foot distancing. Um, it's simply uh, a part of the conversation um, about what it would take to bring pretty much most of the students back. It would require us to operate at three foot distancing. And just like with everything else, the question will be, how is that playing out in the school divisions that are doing it? and they're all school divisions with lower community spread, and it's not far off, but they're lower. And so our approach has always been, let's see how school divisions where the community spread is not as significant, how they do with different approaches. And given that the World Health Organization um, endorses three feet, and that there is, even the, in the Virginia reopening plan, a statement that says where six feet aren't feasible, three feet and masks may be um, possible, it, it's a conversation that's ongoing, and so we can't just ignore it, right? Because that would be one way to bring more students back. That doesn't mean we're going to. It all depends on uh, what we find in the research. We are going to operate at six foot, like our health plan says. We're operating with mandatory masks, and when there are concerns about masks, like again, there was one of the public comments, please bring it to the principal's attention. We do need to know about it. And no, I don't follow um, all the social media posts every day, so I, you know, it's, that's not something I, that just pops out at me every day. So it's, it's good to know if there are concerns, uh, but please you know, um, contact the school where you see that. But to compare 
uh, from two weeks ago when I had the last presentation to today. This is updated information on those school divisions. And so you'll see that we're um, doing a lot better than we were two weeks ago, right? Rockingham County, um, the cases per 100,000 uh, for 14 days uh, was at 235 two weeks ago, and it's now at 140, which is the lowest since August 28th. Yep, so that's good to see, right? Uh, when we talk about the uh, percent positivity, again, we've now dropped from 8.6 to 6.1. You can see with Augusta County, 2.1 to 6.1, like I said, positivity is significantly affected by uh, testing events and how they're conducted. So if there are a lot of testing events that require someone to have symptoms, it drives up positivity. If you have widespread testing, it drives down positivity. JMU is now doing um, widespread testing, random testing of students, and their positivity rate is below 3%. And they've had, ca they've had days with zero positive cases. So again, it's not, this isn't all JMU, right? So, um, but you can see the counties uh, surrounding us. Augusta is lower. Albemarle, you know, it's, there's no road directly to Albemarle, so I don't usually look at them as, as our neighbor, but they, uh, we do have a border with them, a line with them. Uh, Green County is higher, Page County is higher, Shenandoah County is higher, the city is higher. And so in the surrounding counties, um, Augusta and Albemarle are lower, but we're now uh, looking pretty good uh, compared to those, and the trend is still pointing downward. So um, for a number of days in a row now, that number has been going down. Um, just these are the RCPS data trends from September 21st to the 28th, to the 5th, to the 12th, and then from the last board meeting to today. So you can see a pretty significant um, drop there. Same with positivity that's, again, trending down. We want that to continue. We still have weeks to go before November 16th, so we continue to hope that uh, the public will you know, do their part and wear their masks and uh, distance when possible so that those numbers do come down. Today we had four cases, I believe, in Rockingham County, so uh, that's a good number. Um, when we talk about why um, do we believe that it is safe, well, in part because even though the number is orange and not green, and you can see the entire state, basically there's not a single community anymore in green, um, the mitigation strategies play a huge role and they make a huge difference. And I presented data last time, you know, from a number of studies, and the Washington Post also um, had an article that I uh, just read the other day that I came across where they looked at exactly the same information, right? How is it working out in all these school districts across the country? And what they found is the same that I said last time. You know, they find that um, the number actually of uh, the percentage of people in education being positive is lower than the surrounding communities. Uh, the schools aren't driving the spread. We do have um, some staff members who test positive. We have students who test positive. But we've had not a single case in a school um, since the school started where one person gave it to another person in the school. And so you will have positive cases, but that's why masks and uh, distancing are important. And like I said last time, you know, um, an, additional, an additional mitigation strategy now, ventilation. And we've been working hard on that. Um, just before this meeting, I had a conversation with Mr. Reed about um, the option to purchase hundreds of uh, mobile air purifiers for areas where air quality needs to improve a little bit. Uh, in most of our classrooms, when we look at uh, the number of air exchanges per hour, we're right where Harvard Med says, you know, schools should be. So we're looking good in that area. And so that, again, in addition to masks and uh, distancing is a very important strategy for us. And so, um, again, wherever we look, um, opening schools with the mitigation strategies has been very successful and has not driven the community spread that people feared. Uh, most of the events that drive community spread now are home gatherings, right? It is not schools. And so that's an encouraging sign, and that, again, allows us to um, make some changes, but again, in steps and carefully. Um, what we also implemented uh, based on a request we've received from a number of people is the COVID-19 um, dashboard. So uh, the link at the top is a live link in this presentation. Um, we will, it's posted on the homepage. There's a link to this. 
And what it shows is at um, any given point in time, so this is the, uh, the live dashboard um, link right now. You can't um, see the numbers, but uh, there you go. Thank you, Kevin. Um, what you see for each school is the number of staff members and the number of students who spent at least some time in the building while they were contagious and are now on quarantine. So those are the number of people who are currently out on quarantine because they have, they tested positive or were diagnosed with it. And so you can see there are some, but very few. And again, in every case, uh, we trace the contacts, we notify VDH, who then also traces the contacts. And then if there are any um, contacts where we consider them exposed, so uh, within six feet for 15 minutes or more over the course of 24 hours um, is the defini definition of exposure because you need a certain amount of viral um, load to actually get sick unless someone sneezes directly at you, that's different. Um, but in terms of just being around that person, uh, we trace it that way and then those people are quarantined. And so you can see that we have some but very few uh, this will be updated um, practically with every case. So as soon as we enter a case, uh, it will show up on the dashboard. So if members of the community or in the school community uh, want to see what those current numbers are, um, there's a link on the homepage and you can uh, go to it and it will update itself as people uh, return from quarantine. So it should always be uh, the most up-to-date snapshot we have available. So hopefully that also um, helps the community understand you know, what we really see in the buildings. And then uh, finally, again, the context of health data, mitigation factors are important, right? It's, and the uh, Virginia Department of Health sent out new guidelines again today to reiterate, it doesn't mean that because your community spread is at a certain level, you shouldn't open school. What it means is the more your community spread, um, the more community spread you have, the more important the mitigation strategies are. If no one in the community um, is infected, you know, you don't have to worry as much about mitigation, but given that most of the counties and cities have uh, some you know, spread in the orange or red area, it makes it critical. And CDC has said the same thing, just because you're in red doesn't mean you shouldn't open, but you better have a lot of the strategies in place because they mitigate that community spread. And so the numbers matter, but it also matters what we have in place. So we need to be good at physical distancing. We need to be good at using masks correctly and consistently. And again, teaching students and, and um, the staff also using proper hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfecting, and then also the contact tracing, right? And ventilation, again, more recently um, has been uh, um, on the rise as a really important mitigation strategy. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about that and um, are working on, again, improvements to our classrooms, right? And so uh, we'll have um, a lot of additional equipment in place as well that we're that we ordering uh, with some of the coronavirus uh, relief funds that uh, came from Richmond over the last few weeks. We have to spend those by December 30. And so uh, ventilation improvements um, are certainly one piece of that puzzle. Any questions? thought it was important to know that the trends are looking good because for a while, you know, we were um, a little bit too high there uh, and going up. And so that, that 140 today was really good to see. We're about 170 a couple days ago, then 160, 140. So uh, pointing downward is um, very encouraging. Dr. Sheikl, I have one question. So the yes. matrix you showed us with the active cases, uh -huh. when do they drop off? At the end of the quarantine period? Yes. Okay. Yep. Is it so basically when, if someone's return date is today, then today that okay. no longer shows. Okay. Right? And is it 10 or 14 days? Well, if it depends. So if someone is exposed, you know, an exposure doesn't show up, right, on the, on the um, chart. But in an exposure, you have to wait 14 days because okay. from the time you're exposed, it takes a little bit, even if you are symptomatic, to develop the symptoms but from the onset of symptoms, it's 10 days. Okay, just like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for the superintendent? Thank you.
Next on the agenda is differentiated monitoring and support. Dr. Hand. Hello, Jim Falk, members of the school board, and Dr. Scheichel. Last summer, the Virginia Department of Education re received the results <coughs> of a review conducted by the Office of Special Education Programs approximately a year earlier. It was a bit of a surprise to the Virginia Department of Education in that they received what is known as a differentiated monitoring and support report. This highlights areas of concern to the Office of Special Education Programs. So this past summer, the Virginia Department of Education produced a memo to uh, inform school divisions across the state of this decision. And there was also a requirement in that same memo that this information be shared with school boards, which is why I'm here this evening. There were three areas of concern presented to the Virginia Department of Education by OSEP. One was timeline management for due process proceedings was not carefully followed and the uh, OSEP would like to see a uh, much sharper uh, review and a much sharper attention, I suppose, to uh, from the Virginia Department of Education regarding due process hearings and timeline management. So they are in the process of doing that. Uh, a second had to do with mediation, the mediation program. The mediation coordinator happens as part of a training program to sit in on mediation sessions with new mediators. This was considered to be a question of, um, of uh, a concern with impartiality of the process of mediation itself. That same coordinator also sits in periodically with other mediation sessions as a means of supervising the mediators across the state. And this was highlighted by OSEP as an area of concern. So they're addressing that. Uh, more still was the area of independent educational evaluations. In Rockingham County, we have always been quite, um, we've always used that process quite a bit. I've never have held back on that. An independent evaluation occurs when a family is concerned with the results of an eligibility meeting. Either the child was not found eligible, typically the child is not found eligible, and they would like to have essentially a second opinion. We do fund that as required by regulations, both federal and state regulations. Uh, we are fortunate to have the James Madison University Child Development Clinic right here in the middle of our division, which has been helpful. But uh, I have used that quite often, almost to a fault, I would say, uh, since really since 1993 when I, was also, when I was in Page County. I also used that as well as here in Rockingham County. So we have no issues with that, and we will be, we may even be utilized by the Virginia Department of Education as an example of, of how to do business correctly when it comes to independent educational evaluations. I am providing you with some information about the current supervision system utilized by VDOE for school divisions across the state. The first bullet, a state performance plan and annual performance reports. The annual performance reports are a, sent, are a combination of 20 different indicators that are collected each summer. And then of course from around the state, they are all gathered together for the state performance report. These indicators are utilized by the Virginia Department of Education to pinpoint areas of concern both within a particular division or across the state or maybe a, group, a grouping of divisions. Uh, they, they do this gently. Uh, they help us through the process. Uh, they do provide us with samples of policies and procedures and also technical assistance as we work through some of those areas of concern. It is not atypical to have at least one or two indicators uh, turn up as problematic. Part of that is uh, the 100% requirement for a couple of the indicators. Sometimes if you miss a particular timeline for one child, it throws, it throws off the, um, the indicator report and you have to develop a corrective action plan to address that, even though it's only one child. We do have that happen to us occasionally and we do address those issues as they arise. Uh, currently, the Department of Education is offering on-site comprehensive reviews. Uh, this is particularly uh, becomes an issue if your annual performance report or some other compliance determinations are problematic. Uh, targeted reviews are used when there's a trend, if you will, within a particular division of noncompliance that requires both an individual review of certain cases and also a systemic or division-wide review uh, to make sure that uh, the procedural compliance issue is addressed. Usually we have about a year to correct these issues. Desk audits are for divisions who, pre who re present 
the information to Richmond that they are 100% compliant across all of the indicators. That's rare and hard to do, and if a division is, is indicating this, Richmond likes to come and take a look and see just how well you're doing or just, just how you're doing that particular, that particular uh, how you're maintaining that compliance across all of the indicators. Uh, we have not had a desk audit in Rockingham County since I've been here. Self-assessments occur every six years. Uh, Dr. McWilkin, you might remember they, they used to do on-site visits about every five or six years. That stopped several years ago and they replaced it with self-assessments. I did call uh, the Virginia Department of Education to find out about what they might be doing to address some of their concerns and one of the options they are considering is to renew the on-site visits in a five or six year period. They haven't finished finished or finalized that decision, but they are considering that as, um, as, a, as a possibility. It's quite a, an extensive review. When they come and visit, they usually spend three or four days in the division. Uh, they visit several programs, interview parents, interview teachers, and even interview students. Um, I've, the last time we had an, uh, an on-site, I think we were downtown, and I believe that Dr. Kidd was superintendent, so it's been, it's been several years since they've stopped that. And we did well, by the way. We just had one non-compliance when they were here. All right, I also have a, a note there about the planned responses from, to the OSEP findings. One, the policies and procedures regarding the due process hearings will be reviewed, and I bet we're going to have some professional development come out of that in the near future. Uh, the role of the coordinator of mediation services is also being reviewed so that we can take a look, or so the Virginia Department of Education can take a look at how we can best work with mediators and yet not be in the meeting. We need to be, we need to be separated from that. And the last part, um, BDOE is working with OSEP to seek guidance regarding the independent educational evaluation process. And that is, again, that's not been an, an issue for us and I don't suspect that it will be in the future. Are there any questions? Any questions, board members? Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we move into other business. School board questions or comments. Ms. Reed. Uh, I'll pass, Mr. Falk. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McQuilkin. Yes, I have a, a question, and the, perhaps it can't be answered this evening, but I think it's worth looking into, and that has to do with our return of our students in grades two through eight in the hybrid model uh, on November the 16th. I know we are very careful, and, and, if, uh, and we want to be sure that all students wear face coverings. So, Dr. Scheichel, my question is, if a student does not wear a a, a mask, a face covering as a mask, is it possible to wear a shield that would uh, encompass below the, the, the uh, chin and, uh, and above the, uh, the nose? The most important piece when it comes to talking about face coverings is the purpose of someone wearing it. So the purpose of someone wearing the face covering is not to protect that person uh, from getting infected. There's some protection, but that's not um, what really um, is the main purpose. The main purpose is to protect others. So in this pandemic where the main concern is those who may be spreading uh, this virus asymptomatically, is that we pr basically have to act as if everyone is infected. And to then say, what do we do to prevent others from getting sick? If it was about protecting the wearer, then um, there would be some validity to the argument of, well, it's my child, and if my child wants to take this risk, and if I want my child to take this risk, they can come to school without a mask. The purpose, though, is to not infect others. And this is why, for example, you know, um, someone who um, has a medical note that they can't wear a mask, a remote learning is really the option because um, not being able to wear a mask does not give you really the right to infect someone else. And so that's where this gets tricky now. 
uh, the face shields um, really serve a different purpose. The face shields um, are mainly used to protect the person wearing the face shield uh, from getting infected by someone sneezing at them um, who's not wearing a mask potentially um, or by um, someone coughing. Uh, and so the face shield, this was one of the very first questions we asked of VDH. If we um, give everyone a face shield, what would be the impact? It's the same argument as with the uh, plexiglass dividers. Um, the face shield does not prevent airflow, right? So uh, there's no filtering of that air. And so when someone um, sits across the table or next to us with a face shield, uh, that face shield simply when they exhale, the air just flows out underneath. And so there's still that airflow in the room and that's unfiltered. Uh, there's not a filter there. And so that's why a face shield does not protect um, the person on the other side. So um, that's why that, again, the face shield does, is not a replacement of the mask. A face shield can be worn in addition to a mask. So if someone, for example, doesn't do a good job wearing a mask, then uh, for example, as a teacher, if I also wear a face shield and a mask, I protect the other person with my mask, and um, my mask plus a face shield may provide some additional protection, especially, again, if someone's mask uh, comes down, they sneeze, or whatever it may be. And so um, for general use, no, uh, a face shield is not a replacement for the mask. Um, what obviously you know um, could help is uh, greater distancing, um, having classes outdoors. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of uh, benefit to being outside. So, uh, you know, those are some of the strategies that would be theoretically possible, but across the board that doesn't really, you know, w we can't have all the classes outside at, um, you know, 10 foot distancing. So uh, that's a great question. We've gotten it a number of times, but uh, the face shield does not replace the, f the uh, face covering. Mr. Reedon. Thank you, sir. I have what I hope will be an answer in, in the question that I alluded to earlier. Uh, it was brought to my attention that uh, there was some question when people were watching the meetings uh, virtually about uh, school board members looking at their computers or, or whatnot and uh, perhaps not, not paying attention. And I just wanted to explain, when, when I started this a long time ago, we used to get a big paper packet of information. Lowell will remember, sometimes they were literally this thick and we would go through them as we went through the meeting. Now, all of that information is on this device, plus some. And contrary to what it may look like sometimes, to be a board member, you have to multitask. You have to kind of be thinking about what that topic is and perhaps preparing yourself for, for uh, what the next item on the agenda is. That's particularly true for the chair. And, uh, you know, or I may be looking through to see if there's something pertinent to what that speaker's talking about that we're going to address later. Uh, also, on my, on my phone, most of you have a notes section. I will make myself notes of things that I either want to remember to sort of follow up on or a question that I want to ask later in the meeting or something like that. So the amount of time that we're spending, or I'm spending, and each of us have different methods, um, is, is just trying to be prepared and up on the meeting. So it's not, uh, my apologies if it, if it comes across that we're not listening, but that's uh, not the case. Now my question, uh, Dr. Scheichel, that I alluded to earlier, I met with a parent in my office the other day um, who was concerned about, um, actually the mental health of, of her daughter and she was talking about how her daughter just was overwhelmed and that, and that teachers were dropping assignments on them in, on off days from the day of that class. And that if that student didn't pick up on that assignment, they got penalized for it being late. Um, Ms. Ham spoke about some things that are happening. What can we do as a division to use that term to show more grace to the students as we, as we work through this? I don't want to give too long of an answer <laughs> because these things are inevitably complicated and um, I think what Ms. Ham, you know, alluded to was, you know, the, the, um, 
statement that we've made before, you know, grace is greater than grades. We um, talked about this even in the spring. And in a pandemic like this, it's not easy being a teacher. Let's say that, right? Um, that was also brought up, you know, teachers are asked to switch modes from um, remote instruction to blended instruction to in-person instruction. And parents who've spent you know, just a few weeks uh, with maybe one or two children at home, trying to work with them through all this. Um, no, it's really, really difficult, even with your own kids. And teachers um, have this ability to work with, you know, 20-some kids and make uh, learning happen that simply in a remote environment like this, where it's all this mix, is incredibly difficult. And so um, first-year teachers, for example, will oftentimes a plan for a lesson and think this will take 40 minutes, only to find out when the bell rings, um, you know, <laughs> they're not even halfway done, right? Um, I know I've given presentations here where Ms. Reed asked me beforehand, how long is your presentation gonna be? And I said, it's gonna be 20 minutes. And an hour 15 later, we're still, um, <laughs> you know, reviewing some of the information. So it, it happens, right? And so um, th it takes time to adjust for that. I wanna say that. Uh, for parents, it's incredibly difficult to live in a school year like this. Um, families have, you know, full-time jobs, and uh, sometimes the high school student is at home taking care of the middle school student and the elementary student. And at the same time, they're supposed to do all this work for the classes that they're in. And uh, I know that, you know, if I was helping my little brother uh, back home, I certainly wasn't the most patient, right? Because I had other things on my mind and other things I wanted to do. And then parents come home tired from work and it's incredibly difficult, right? And then to provide services to students with disabilities. This is not the education system that anyone wants. This is not the education system that we say, oh wow, look at how great education is, right? Under the circumstances, we can only bring a certain number of students back, we, have th we follow the regulations, and then we focus on how, given the limitations that we face, do we provide that in a way that doesn't um, make teachers' lives miserable and families' lives miserable? And I think the only way we can do that is to go back to what we've talked about for a year now, and that is, Let's just admit that not everything we do in school is equally important. If I have a third grader and that third grader can't read, it doesn't matter what I do in social studies class. And I used to always you know, bring math as a topic, but I was a social studies teacher, so I'm gonna talk about my subject. What we do in social studies in third grade, I'm sure it's valuable but it's not as important when we only have limited amounts of time as reading is right now. We can catch up students on the social studies part. And I guarantee you, I taught seniors. Um, I don't know whether I can get it to the second decimal in terms of percent of information they remembered from third grade social studies, right? It's, a, it's not the critical piece right now. We need to get families and students and teachers to feel like they can operate like normal human beings in this environment. And it means we have to cut back and not pretend that we can get all this stuff in. We shouldn't be cramming everything in, you know, to pretend like we can get all the, the material in and we shouldn't pretend that we can now, maybe because we only have A day and B day and we have, you know, two days a week where the kids are here, that they can make up for all this stuff on the other three days. If that was a valuable approach, why wouldn't we do that all the time, right? Why wouldn't we build school, only half the schools and you know, have half the kids in the building every day and then three days of remote learning if that was really what we think is good learning? So we need to focus on what's important. Reading is incredibly important at the younger ages, so we need to focus on that. If you can't read, you'll never understand what science talks about anyway. Uh, you know, in, in math, we need to focus on the skills that really drive uh, what is important next year. What builds toward next year's success? We have to also understand that fourth grade isn't gonna be what fourth grade normally is next year. So there'll be long-term remediation, right? And when we talk about high school classes, you cannot tell me that everything we learn in US history 
is, imp is equally important and should be the focus on right now, right? Because if I gave everyone in this room, and there are multiple former social studies teachers, a test on 11th grade US history that really covers all that material, I don't wanna see the results, right? So it's important to understand that we can limit the amount of work without saying we have terrible education. We need to focus on what's truly important. And so yesterday, I had a long conversation with a resident of Broadway who I've known for a long time, who's well known in the community. And she said that um, her grandchild is in tears all the time, and so is she. And I asked her to just paint me that picture. You know, what does this look like from the point of view of the families? And I asked her to have those families maybe write a letter and then sign it all and, and have that sent to me. And she decided instead to post it on Facebook and say, hey, here's his email address. Everyone just email him the stories. And I've really just, I mean, I've, I've got 25 or so between last night and, and this morning. And we'll distribute those among leadership and then talk to principals about it. We've already done some of that. One of the um, people emailed me last night and said, I just want you to know last week we saw a significant drop. And so, because a couple weeks ago, we already talked about, you know, what should be expected. And we'll continue to have that conversation. And so, there are incredible stories there of, you know, there are some cases where someone just doesn't want to do the work, right? That doesn't mean that that's what we're talking about, right? Where there is time and just no desire to complete it, right? We need to figure out maybe how to reach that student. But that's a different story from the families that are just, they everyone's in tears, and that's not what this should be like. Life is already tough enough right now for everyone, for our educators and for our families, and we need to find a better way, and if that means we need to you know, shift what we focus on, then that's okay, and I think our families need to hear that, and our teachers need to know it's okay, right? And I'll send that out again, you know, what we talked about in the spring, grace is more important than grades, and it, it's just, you know, today I said to someone, can you imagine if, um, in 1942, in Pearl Harbor, I said this uh, in a regional superintendent's meeting today with someone from DOE, I said, imagine if in the spring of 1942, they would have given state assessment in Pearl Harbor, right? And then said, well, how can you not teach all these kids just because your whole you know, place was bombed out in December, right? Well, how, how can you not so focus on the assessments and teach them everything we used to teach? It doesn't work the same way, right? What do you teach? What do you focus on? What should be the learning activities in a global pandemic? What do we focus on? First of all, we need to focus on how do we support each other as a community, right? Without finding every divisive issue to complain about what, the, what everyone else is doing. We need to focus on mental and, and behavioral health. You know, you, you're not gonna learn if you're in tears. You know, and what do we do to limit the work so that it's reasonable? We need to have expectations, but it, they don't need to be the same ones that we usually have when we have students in a building for six hours with professionals around them all day long who are trained to do this. None of our teachers learned in their education programs how to conduct education in this environment. So we need to acknowledge that and, and we all need to show that grace. And you know, as some said, we talk about it and we only expect it from the other side. No, we, this is on us too, right? Um, it, it, it makes me wanna cry to read these stories from families that are trying their best to get through this and uh, we shouldn't make life more difficult because at that point it's not as important you know, what the learning objective was in that class three years ago. And teachers, just they need the permission to do this and then they need help if, yeah. if they can't get to the point where they know what maybe is not included. And we all just need to be okay with it. And so it doesn't mean low expectations. It means as a community getting through a pandemic together and doing that in a way where students still learn the most important things, but they're not all equally important. Yeah. So that's, again, a longer response than you may have wanted, but yeah. it's complicated and it takes everyone to step up. And uh, fr from where I'm sitting, teachers do have the permission, right? And yeah. I already got a couple emails from teachers even tonight saying, you know, I've cut back to about 25% of what I usually cover. And guess what, it's still okay, yeah. right? Yeah. So we can't throw out everything or really important stuff, but 
every class there are things you know that that uh, we can we can uh, do differently. Yeah, yeah but you know, with with my grandson who's the, a freshman this year, I, I'd like to see him be a little more uh, concerned about it. He's perfectly content to just, yeah, I'll get it done. Don't worry about it. But she was talking about her daughter, who is a very conscientious, hardworking student, and was working on I, I'm just recounting the story that she had apparently five screens open to work on this assignment and on a side on a screen this size that that's kind of kind of difficult anyway and then she lost connection yeah. and just melted yeah. because there was this fear of I've lost all of this stuff yeah. and I don't know how we we can't necessarily solve the the times that internet connection are lost but when something like that happens I, 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 I I really hesitate, and I know I sort of brought this up the last time. I don't want to overuse the term grace, but when, you know, when something like that happens, we have to be willing to accept that yeah. there, there needs to be some allowance for that kind of thing. And I want to be clear again, this is not something where we should just say, uh, these teachers, they're assigning too much homework. For two decades, you know, we've just forced teachers to abandon their own creativity and to drill students on stuff that even teachers knew you know, really wasn't necessary. And now it's, re it's really difficult to step back from that. Right? It's difficult to step back from that. And it, you know, Ms. Reed was at the Ag Advisory and we hear it from those teachers. You know, they will say, our hands-on, real-world learning experiences suffer because the kids focus on this other stuff that we call, you know, the academic classes. When I went to the FFA convention two years ago, I had teachers tell me, you know, how they sometimes feel as second tier teachers because they are teaching in these hands-on classes. And I said, I, 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 that's not acceptable, right? And so now we're losing on something even more important. You know, the kids that come to school to play in the band or to participate in these activities that are truly driven by real problems in the real world. And if that now takes a back seat to you know, other things, we need to work on it. But teachers, you know, they want to do the perfect job and they've been told for so long and you know, they've, they've been forced to write goals that are 100% of my students will do this and furthermore, they will accomplish all this and, and we force them to do this and it's so hard to then step back and say, that's what I've been trained to do, right? And now to step back, so everyone needs help, including our teachers. And, and the first step is to say, you have permission from us, right? And so we'll start with that and, and go down that line. And so um, yep. we'll, we'll be better next week than this week and better the following week and, you know, get there together. Yeah. And I, I want to be clear that I'm in a, in a it, this is not a, a teachers versus students. Situation. Exactly. I, I mean, I've talked to teachers who have been in tears, same yeah. as I've talked to, to to parents and kids who have been in tears about it, and and so I, you know, I'm just. I think you put it very well, Dr. Scheichel. Is is they need to know that they have that permission to 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 back off, for lack of a better term, and 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 I I second that as a board member. I mean, that that that's the case, but you know, we we also. We, we, need, we need to be hearing what these kids and parents are going through, and I know we are, and that's just, I, I wanted to communicate her, her concern, so yeah. thank you. Absolutely, and that has been a conversation now for, for a couple of weeks, but again, it takes time. Dr. Scheichel, did you have any parting? I just want to say thank you to Steve Reed. Um, while I was presenting, he sent me information on our um, HVAC systems. So there are two organizations in you know, the American uh, Society for of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. They have one set of standards for reopening schools in this pandemic and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, independent you know, contractors have looked at our systems and feel that um, our CPS is uh, doing what is feasible and viable in both areas of recommendation, CDC and uh, the HVAC engineers. So thanks for sending that and for continuing that work. It's, it's a really important piece.
Board members, we've reached the part of our agenda where we need have need to enter into closed meeting. May I have a motion? I move that the board enter a closed meeting to discuss and consider in the following pursuant to the provisions of Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1 personnel specific public officers, appointees, or employees for the purpose of considering such individuals assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, salary, or resignation. Thank you, Ms. Reed. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. McQuilkin. Is there any discussion about going into closed meeting? Hearing none, please cast your vote. The motion passes. We are now in closed session. Thank you all for coming this evening.